and we will get started. So welcome to Simone Space. Uh, literally a space to come together, discuss issues that some find uncomfortable but are really vitally important if we're going to see some changes. And with all that's happening in the world at the moment, I think it's imperative that we have this discussion uh, tonight. So talking about three main areas, talking about uh, how to talk about race when it isn't on the agenda, non-racist versus anti-racist, and also what to tell children about race. Uh, last time, if I could just, sorry, ask everyone to mute, that would be great. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the three speakers who've been waiting patiently, so thank you so much. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them. We've got Jade Linton, and if you just wave Jade, because now there are a lot of people, I don't, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Jade is Head of Human Resources at the law firm where she works, and also a HR and employment law expert, accountable for the overall performance of the HR function. Yeah. We also provide strategic counsel on all people matters to practice leaders and executives. Jade is an equality and diversity champion with a passion for making the law accessible and understandable to all. We have Stuart Dix, if you give a wave, Stu. Thank Hi. you. Stuart is a secondary school science teacher and also a worship leader at his local church. He grew up in the Forest of Dean, an area that when he grew up had very little diversity. And so many of the issues that we're seeing now, he didn't witness until he moved to study in Birmingham at the age of 18. And we have Aisha, the wave Aisha. Aisha Thomas is an assistant principal in an inner city secondary school in Bristol and a relentless campaigner and activist. Following her success in raising awareness through the BBC Inside Out West short documentary film, exploring the shortage of black teachers in Bristol, Aisha went on to deliver her celebrated TEDx talk, Why Representation Matters. So honestly, we, I think, you know, we don't have enough time to even really scratch the surface of a lot of these issues that we're talking about tonight. Um, we'd need a lot longer, but we need to talk to them. This is about opening up the conversation and hopefully, well, centered around actionable outcomes open up dialogue and so everybody listening can take from it and then go and you know implement where you are i believe that if we can all do what we can in our sphere of influence then we'll see a lot of changes and yeah we can do what we need to do where we are so let's get right into it let's deep dive straight away and i'm going to start with jade jade i'd love you to speak to us about how we can you know, open up the conversation about race in a, in a workplace where there lacks diversity, where race isn't on, on the agenda. How do we go about doing that? Okay, so I'd start by saying, um, Simone, and to our listeners tonight, that before we even get to an agenda, before we even open up those conversations, we need to make sure that we are well. Um, speaking specifically to black people, um, we are not okay. And I say collective we, because I have had enough conversations with our community, family, friends, and so on over the last few weeks to say, we need to do a self check first of all, before we start opening up tables for discussion. Um, speaking for myself, first of all, black people, we are tired, make sure that you rest, recover and recharge. Over the last three, three weeks, we have seen some horrible things. And um, the George Floyd matter and killing murder is just the tip of the iceberg. If you just imagine with me for one moment, the tip of the iceberg, you've got the iceberg beneath. George Floyd was the tip of that iceberg. For decades, we have seen and have had rehearsed stories, videos of racial injustice which has triggered in us painful instances of racial injustice in our own lives and in those close to us so before we can set an agenda or influence any agenda i would say you need to take care of your mental health first and foremost i'd add to that that now is an opportune time for our white allies those who have professed to being allies to say okay whilst you're resting whilst you're recovering i've done the learning piece i'm i've got this that's what 
you know, I'm a big dreamer, but that's what I'm hoping is taking place. That our allies can say, I've got this, you rest, recharge, recuperate, I've got this. When you're ready, we can go move forward with this together. Now, when you are rested and you've checked your own well being and you're keeping that monitored and processed, then we can start looking at agendas. And I'd start by saying, um, let's not wait for an agenda on this to come to us. Let's set the agenda. It sounds quite radical, doesn't it? But really, it isn't. Allow me to explain. So, employers, starting with the workplace to address your question, many employers pride themselves on having an open door policy, being forward thinking, where we want to listen to all that you have to say. Now is the time for us to expect a return on those words, to see some action, some follow through on the equal opportunities policy. And so rather than waiting for the agendas to be set, let's set them. Are you having regular one-to-one -one meetings, catch-ups with your, with your team leaders, with your managers? Let's talk about race. Let's put that on the agenda. Let's talk about underrepresented groups why that might be. Let's talk about what you're doing to be more than just an equal opportunities lawyer on paper, but the manifestation of that promise in the workplace. Let's talk about that. Um, I then go on to say, if you're well thought of in your workplace, you know, diarise that meeting. And I'd go as far as saying that our leaders, you know, in the work they get a bit prickly get a bit nervous when they see that word race if you've got to tap into that those nerves and fear of a claim or she said race i better make sure i go to that meeting then fine it really does not matter what gets you through the door what we're looking for is a platform and a table for some real notable discussion right now i then say in terms of my own walk um when you're when you're at that table you're set you're setting the agenda you're having these discussions set the tone um, you're likely to be in front of someone who's feeling a little bit nervous and on edge because many of my, I'm going to say white peers, white people, a lot of them are worried about saying the wrong thing. So if it means you set the tone and say, look, I will not hold it against you if you use some clumsy terminology and some clumsy language here. I'll call you out for it, but I'm not going to hold it against you. As long as you don't hold it against me because... I might be getting, I might get a bit emotional. This runs deep for me. I'm passionate about that. Be prepared for that. It's not aggression, it's emotion and passion. You've set the tone, now let's talk about race. In addition to that, I would say know your territory. Not everyone listening to this discussion has the ear of their managing director mm. but, or decision makers in the company but you may have the ear of decision influencers. You know, coming up in the profession, I have had the ear of influencers who could occupy spaces that I was not qualified yet to occupy. So I could make sure that that was tabled on the agenda. Some of us don't have the ear of managing directors, but some of us may be married to a managing director. They may be your brother, they may be your cousin. The agenda for race does not have to be in the boardroom. I would love it to be there. It doesn't, it's not just in the boardroom. Think about the agendas that you can set in your living room. Look how many agendas we set across the dining room table. We talk about finances, we talk about wealth management. Yes, potty training and what's for dinner, but we have some real big discussions. So we sometimes think if we can't, if we don't have the platform for a massive change, then I might as well not do anything. But no, no, no. Some of you are related to decision makers and decision influencers, and some of you are raising them. There is always an opportunity for an agenda. So know your territory. Um, so I would, I would say that that's an important thing. Um, I'd also say that become inquisitive and start asking questions and um, you all know I, I work in the West Midlands but I'm not from the West Midlands I'm from Bristol so when I when I came here six years ago to practice law I would accept every invitation going Jade can you speak at this event Jade can you write in this publication yes 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 because I wanted to make a name for my firm and I wanted to make a name for myself but then 
I became aware of the fact that, you know, I wasn't having to knock on these doors and ask for these invitations. They wanted me to come and speak at their events. They wanted me to write in their publications. I thought, no, I have some power, I have some power here. You know, they're coming to me because I'm good. And because I'm good, and because you, you want me, if you want me enough, You'll be prepared for me to ask you some questions, to, to set an agenda about, before I speak at your event, tell me a bit more about what you're doing about race. Tell me why your senior management team looks the way it does. I've noted your policies on equal opportunities and I don't see that reflected in your teams. Tell me why. Yeah? So any speaking engagement, anything like that, you know, the, know the power of your territory where you're asked to speak is not just on your workplace platform, it's where you spend your money, where you spend your time. We can be so frivolous with our time, with our money, we're not, with our investments, and we're not asking the question, before I invest my money with you, tell me what you're doing about race. Mm -hmm. Before I spend money with your company, I want to see what you're doing about race. There's power in your time, in your influence, in your platform. So. I would say those were some long-winded answer to your question, Simone, but those are just, you know, a, a potted history, if you like, of some of the ways in which we can timetable an agenda for race. Brilliant. No, thank you so much. And I should have said as well, if, for those listening, if, um, whilst you're listening, if you have any questions, comments, please put them in the chat. And what we'll do, we will endeavour to get um, around to, to some of the questions. Obviously, we've run a bit over time now because of the issues at the beginning but please do put them in the chat and if we have time we will try and get to them but thank you Jay. wow set the tone and it doesn't have to just be in the boardroom love that love that so Stuart let's move over to you Angela Davis said that it's not enough to be uh, non-racist we have to be anti-racist and I'm really interested in hearing more even from you about your experience of growing up in an area where, which lacked diversity, only really experiencing diversity when moving to Birmingham at 18. But now you're really a, a champion and, and, and actively anti-racist and pushing for inclusion and diversity. Talk to us about that and how others can, um, can do the same, especially our white allies. How can they be actively anti-racist? Absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I grew up in an area which um, diversity was, was limited. There wasn't a lot of diversity in the area I grew up. Um, and it was in coming to, to Birmingham to come and study. Um, that really, my, my eyes were open, my mind was open. Um, and I started to, to really learn more um, from the friendships I've built um, up here. Um, and so obviously, over the last few weeks, it's really like come to the forefront um to really sort of question myself and and sort of look at my own um education and looking at oh, okay am i okay with understanding everything that's going on um what's the reason what's the heart behind everything that's happening um and i started to obviously ask ask questions and, and that's a great question you know what is the difference between someone that's just not racist and but someone that's actually going out there and actually being actively um anti-racist um, and I think the first thing, um, Jade, you, you really hit the nail on the head with this, is you said, obviously, a lot of people are afraid of what they are going to say uh, and afraid to actually say something um, because they may say something wrong. They may some, say something that um, they don't, they're a bit clumsy with the, with the, sort of, um, the way they say it. And I think that that's really important. I think that's the first reason that people are um, not being anti-racist and actually coming out and being active about this and staying silent. Um, is because there is an intrinsic fear in white people currently um, for, for actually uh, speaking up and saying it's wrong and what's going on. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a, um, a story in the, in the Bible and sort of the Good Samaritan. And actually, kind of like looking at that, I kind of thought, well, actually, the the Levi and the priest in that story, they were very much you know good people. They they taught the law. They understand understood morals. Um, but it was a, a difference between understanding. Um, and actually doing something about it and actually seeing the injustice in front of them and going over and actually doing something to help um, put that injustice right. You know, they, their fear was of the fact that they were going to get hurt themselves. Um, their fear was actually that if they went over, what would people think? Um, and so I think that, that first uh, fear zone, that first fear area is where, as a, a white person, 
being an ally, um, we need to overcome that fear. That we need to be okay to have conversations and start that dialogue and not be afraid of, of, of getting it wrong. Um, and those uncomfortable conversations that may take place. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Um, you know, a lot of people right now are saying, obviously, you know, they're coming out and saying all, all lives matter. Um, when people are saying black lives matter. And I think actually that in itself is showing that people don't want to take responsibility. They, they want to shy away from the conversations by saying all lives matter. What they're doing is actually they are saying, I don't have to actively do anything then. I can say all lives matter and actually I don't have to take any action. I don't have to support. I don't have to get behind this. Um, you know, I'd love to say to the, those people that are saying all lives matter, I would like to say, okay, so whatever area you want to focus on in lives matter, in my, maybe you need to campaign to the same level that Black Lives Matter are right now, if you feel so passionate about that area. Um, but actually what, what I've come to, come to understand with that, that, that sort of statement um, is that actually, uh, if I look at myself and when I'm looking at tasks I'm doing for work and stuff like that, I'm hopeless at multitasking. Um, I'm rubbish uh, when it comes to trying to prioritise my, my task and what I need to do. And what actually ends up happening is if I try and do everything at once, and I try and put my energy into everything I've got to do in a day, um, it gets messy. Uh, and actually I don't get anywhere and I don't see the change that I want in, in what I've got to uh, address. So what we're trying to say is obviously, you know, in being an ally right now is that that cry of black lives matter, it needs to be a focus because if there is going to be a change, if there is going to be something that is actually going to be seen in our society to actually to bring about um, justice, to bring about equality, then actually, if we try and focus on everything at once, it's not going to happen. And actually, we need to focus on Black Lives Matters right now so that we can actually see a drive forward in change. Um, and I think that's the first thing. Um, so I think the first thing is that, yeah, the difference between a, a non-racist and a, an anti-racist is the differences between silence and speaking up uh, and being active. Um, I think the second thing, um, the difference between a non-racist and, and being anti-racist is the difference between sympathy and empathy. Um, so once we can move past that fear um, and start a dialogue and start conversations and actually more than that, listen uh, and educate and, and listen and learn. Because um, I've got to be honest, I'm not an expert in any way in this area because, you know, people for years strove for this equality. Um, and it's about white people listening. Uh, and actually in that conversation learning um and so the second area is obviously to, to sit down to listen to learn to, to start to self-evaluate um to start to actually be vulnerable in conversations as well um you know i, I know again um, i'm coming from a christian point of view on on some of these things but you know jesus had a great example of this when she, he sat at the well with the woman um the samaritan woman he listened to her story he showed empathy it, it made the disciples uncomfortable but actually, um, it, was, it was that initial conversation that opened up the heart of, of, of Jesus in that, in that um, conversation. And I think, you know, I've tried to, um, in the last weeks, um, really sort of self-evaluate and, and look at how can I be um, showing empathy? Um, and so I tried to consider in my own life, I guess, um, an example of where I felt exclusion myself um, to try and work towards was empathy. The only example I could think of um, was when I was younger, you know, being in, in school and, and um, being picked for a football team. And you know where they sort of line up and they pick you um, who wants to be on what team. And, and I remember like being picked last and the feeling that I had there of being picked last um, and thinking, you know, but, but rightly so because I was rubbish. Um, so, you know, it was based on my ability. You know, I was never going to be picked first based on that. And, but then I started to think, Imagine what that would be like for me if, and that feeling I had back then, if every time I was lined up in that line to, to want to be picked for, for a football game, that I wasn't picked last because of my ability, but I was picked last because of the colour of my skin. And then I started to think if that happened every time. And then, and then even more so, trying to move past that a little bit more, I started to think, okay, well, what if I was the best footballer and I had the skills and actually I had a right, I should have been captain but yet I was still being picked last. And that was because of the color of my skin. And then I started to realize what the black people over the years and years and years have gone through 
Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. That was the only way I could, could sort of empathize and start to understand what it might feel like with that exclusion and what might, that might feel like with that injustice and what that might feel like with that inequality um, moving forward. So that was, that was sort of the way that I could look at the sort of the difference maybe between moving from sympathy and acknowledging that the racism is, exists and then understanding. Um, and that's only going to come through dialogue and through conversations. Um, and then the last, the last thing I sort of consider when it was sort of moving between non-racist and being anti-racist is there is a difference between participation and between understanding privilege. So, you know, there are unfortunately people in our country who are and hold racist beliefs and, and they do actively participate in racism. Um, however, obviously the, there are a majority of white people in this country are not racist. And it's not about participating in that racism that is the importance in, in order to um, come about with change. What, they, what we need to understand is actually it's all about understanding that we're privileged because of our skin. That white people actually, there is a privilege that we don't have to go through the same um, feelings of inequality. We don't have to go through the same ideas of you know, putting a hoodie on and, and going for a jog and actually someone crosses the road because you're, you're a black person, not because you're, uh, you know, you're out there to do anything. It's that prejudgment. We don't have to have that prejudgment. And that's part of being white privileged. It's part of understanding that actually we are privileged for being white. Um, you know, I think actually through this sort of last few weeks, um, I started to understand um, because people have posted online um, and I've got some great friends out there that have put some great blogs together and things. And Simone is one of those. Um, and a friend of mine, Mal, started to uh, post in her blog um, about the idea of microaggression. And I'd never understood. I didn't, I didn't even know what that word meant um, until recently. And actually, that caused me to self-evaluate and caused me to sort of have to learn, like, what have I said or what have I acted in through my life that actually is okay, you know, is, is, is justified by society because we live in this, um, this area of systematic, systemic racism that I've had to question myself and, and say, well, actually, no, is that acceptable? Um, you know, some examples like people asking, where do you come from originally? And I'm like, that's not okay. You know, that isn't okay to, to say that. Um, you know, saying, is that your real hair? You know, these were some of the things that Mal was bringing up. And I was thinking, do you know what, that, that sort of question has been asked. I've seen that so many times. Um, and it's, it's almost accepted in society and it's, it's not acceptable to do that. Um, you know, you, you, would, you would question someone that was overtly racist saying, go back to where you came from. And do you know what, even, that, even thinking about that, I always question people that are that racist that they'd say that. Because I go, do you know what, do you know what country you live in? You know, are you, are you French? Did you come from the Norman invasion? Or did you come from the Viking invasion? Were you Anglo-Saxon? You know, can you actually trace your heritage for belonging in this country? And I just, you know, you wouldn't even question that. And you would challenge that overt racism. But would you challenge someone that says that to you, says, you know, um, where do you actually come from originally? Would you challenge that? And it's for white people to actually recognize that, that microaggression that Mal was talking about in that blog, um, to be able to make the change. Um, and I think that's really important um, that we, we do reevaluate things we said. You know, I, as a school teacher, I, I know one thing I need to, to do better. And that is when it comes to doing assemblies, I sometimes skip over names I can't pronounce. And I'm like, that's not right. It doesn't show the worth of that child um, because actually to take the time to go up to the child, to ask them how they pronounce their name, values that child and values them and actually you know I, i'm thinking well that, that's so wrong of me to have done that and actually you know that, that's something that people say all the time oh i can't i'm sorry if i can't pronounce your name right we'll ask them and have that conversation with them and show they're actually worth you know and the, and the value of their name by by doing so so you know i've had to challenge myself recently um and i think that's part of the part of the journey if we're going to grow then we've got to self-evaluate as white people we've got to ask the questions we've got to have the uncomfortable conversations so i guess to summarize um so the first thing is we need to move from fear um in order to grow so we've got to move from the idea that, that sometimes we're going to get it wrong but we've got to be open to conversations and open to listening uh, and not be afraid to get it wrong um and but actually listen and, and and learn um obviously to speak out you know don't stay silent um make sure you're being vocal supporting black lives matter right now is our focus and until we see a change until black lives matter 
all lives count matter because that playing field isn't level at the moment. And then I guess the last thing is surrounding ourselves with people that look and think differently to ourselves and actually having dialogue. Um, so yeah, I think that's um, what I've kind of got from, from recent weeks and from, from obviously my own experiences moving forward. Brilliant. Great points there, um, Stuart. I think something I've taken away from that is it's about honesty, transparency, and being willing to learn and ask ourselves some hard conversation, uh, ask ourselves some hard questions, and having conversations. Um, yeah, like I said, we'll we'll take that and we'll do a bit more at the end of op open uh, questions because I'm sure there I can see some questions coming in the comments as well, so we'll cover those. Um, Aisha, I over to you next. I really wanted to talk about. Uh, children and she used um spoke about children in terms of um pronunciation etc but thinking about children we know that they're they see so much now you know the murder of george floyd that's everywhere and black lives matter and, and what's going on they're they're probably seeing it social media etc how do we go about speaking to children about race um aisha or or should we or should we be shielding them as much as possible can you talk to us about that please of course. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for participating and listening. It's greatly appreciated. So thank you. Um, I think what's really important to consider and to think about is the threat that none of us want to have these conversations, but it's vital and crucial that we do. I wish I didn't have to talk about race. I wish I didn't have to talk about racism, but it's the reality of the world and the context that we currently live in. And right now, all silence does is reinforce racism. So it's really imperative for our young children that we have these conversations. Because right now, when you think about us as adults, when you think about our brain development and who we are, we already have our thinking. So what we develop is something called a primary schema. And that primary schema is all about the foundations that we have when we are young children. And you can never break that schema. What you have to develop is a secondary schema that you begin to constantly repeat, 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 repeat until it replaces the primary, but it will always sit there. So what is vital is you catch children from birth because catching them whilst they're in secondary school, whilst they're in university, whilst we're as adults is far too late. They are the next generation and we have to prioritize them because right now in this moment, equality means nothing to me. Equality means I'm just gonna give you all the same. Our kids do not need to all receive the same. What our kids need right now is to have equity. And equity means making sure that each child gets what they need. Each child receives the information that they require. Because until we get to a point of equity, those barriers are still in place. Not all of us start from the same base point. So we need to make sure that we understand that. Early years is the most important time in terms of education. Absolutely more important than any other time in your life. Because what happens at that stage is where you have your health and your development. Healthy development of all children to take place needs to be balanced. And we need to think about their social, emotional, spiritual, and educational needs. And when I say spiritual, I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about the way in which they develop, okay? And if we don't take the time to do that, we dismantle those young people before they're even speaking words because zero to five is so vital. Your brain develops faster between zero to five than at any other time in your life. You absorb more information from zero to five than any other time in your life. And those relationships and those messages will make the building blocks for the rest of your being, for every belief system that you have. So we need to capture them at that time because that is the only way we are going to dismantle the racial structures that are in the minds of all of the children that are around us. Because that brain development is crucial. Because children are like sponges. They will absorb every relationship, every sound, every thought that they hear from somebody else, everything they eat, everything they taste, everything they touch, constantly changing them. So this is where we have to get those foundations of learning correct. And if we don't, that creates the behavior because those are the behavior blocks that will be laid and that's what will shape their world. So when you think about the fact that children develop and learn from the carers that are around them, you have to think about how influential then those people are. 
And it's going to be two types of people. It's going to be their parents or their caregivers, and it's going to be education because education is going to provide the first kind of ideology outside of the family home or the community or the local context. So let's just break it down a moment. So let's give you a little bit of research, a little bit of science. So when a child is born, a child sees everybody initially equally. They can't see race. They can't see whether you're black or you're white. You're not born racist. You're not born prejudiced. You can't see it. However, by three months, a child begins to look towards favorably, favorably their caregivers. So they will look at the shape, they will look at the skin complexion, and they will be drawn to anybody who looks like them. Vital. When you get to the age of two, so that's not very long between that time frame, a child can begin to understand race so much that they, be, they are able to ascertain the behaviors of different people based on their race. A simple way to look at this is any of you can Google the Dole test. Now what the Dole test did, it demonstrated that at the age of two, children could already see race. Not only could they see race, they understood what people thought of those different racial groups. So they did an experiment with a number of black children and a number of white children. And they gave them a black doll and a white doll. And what they did at the beginning is they got them to actually describe how they saw those dolls. So they said that the dolls were ugly. They said that the dolls didn't um, look very nice. They said that the dolls were bad people. But the last question that they posed to those black children was, and which doll do you look like? And you could see the physical emotion drop from their faces. Because at that point, they realized that they were the black doll. After they said all those bad things about the doll, they said all these things about their race, and then they realized that's who they are. Just deep that for a minute. Two years old. So you can't tell me it's not important to talk to children about race. Because by the age of two, they have that thinking. By three, a child will choose their playmate by race. So when you think about what a child's been exposed to, they're already going to begin to think, oh, which children should I hang around with? Who do I want to play with? And that's sometimes where, particularly in um, schools that are less diverse, you might begin to see that odd child sat in the corner on their own. Because at this point, they're beginning to think, you don't look like me. You're not one of us. I don't know why I feel like this, but something tells me I need to not hang around with you. So I'm going to leave that child on their own. By four to five, a child can begin to express racial, racial prejudice. They begin to pick up the language. Although they don't understand the nuances, they understand the language. And we can see plenty of examples of that. And people find them funny, I find them disgusting. But you look on social media and someone will give their child a black doll, a white child, and you'll hear that black child go, oh, that's horrible, I don't want that doll. And they chuck it down and you see lots of memes like that. And people start laughing at it and they find it hilarious. Stop for a moment. How on earth does a four-year-old child already think that doll is so disgusting that they don't want it? Bear in mind, it's a brand new doll. Come out the package, you'll be excited. Your parents bought you a gift home. But because the doll is black, you don't want it? Understand what that child must have heard for that child to have that reaction. When my son was in primary school, he suffered racism when he was only four years old, to the point where I moved him to a new secondary school. He was picked on. The kids stood on his work. They pushed him in mud. Four. Now, I can't be angry at the parents. I'm sorry, the child. I have to be angry at the parent because that four-year-old child didn't know. They've learned it. But you cannot tell me a four-year-old child has that thinking on their own. That's their culture, that's their contact, that's their parents. It's what they've been exposed to. That's not okay. By six years of age, my son went to another school. He was told he couldn't go to a party because he was black. That's not okay. I've got to explain to my son that. And then my son says to me, mommy, I don't want to be black anymore because black people can't go to parties. Six years old. Already, my son doesn't want to be black. He doesn't like his blackness. Because at a simplistic level, black means exclusion. Six. 
So begin to understand why it's so important to talk to your children about race. By the time your child gets to five, typically children of color, black children, BAME, whatever definition you want to use, by the time the child gets to that age, they don't typically have any preference. They'll hang around with anybody because they're used to seeing lots of different types of diversity and they're used to hearing from their parents that you need to involve yourself with other communities. You need to play with white children because actually there's a level of superiority with those communities and you need to learn that. Yet at five years old, white children will still favor their own and will still typically play with their own communities. So that's when you begin to see those divisions. By five, six, a child can now have an adult behavior. So now they might hit you. They might spit at you. They might call you racial terms because at that age, they've got the confidence because they've had five years of those building blocks being built. Whether that's the hair texture, the skin color, the nose shape, your lips, all of those things they would have seen and heard. And it's worse for children in this generation because they are getting it through media. They're getting it TV, radio, books, school, constant rhetoric in their minds all of the time. When they go into a shop and they see advertisements all of the time. When they watch TV programs, they see how different communities are depicted all of the time. So by six years of age, that child is well past the point of being able to have those conversations. But you have to make the choice the choice to have the discussion. So what are the best ways to do this? First and foremost, I am an absolute advocate of conversation. Conversation must take place with all children, not just black children, all children, because discrimination isn't just about race, but race is the lens I'm talking to you about today. But it's really important to understand that that level of discrimination needs to be rooted out from birth. So you need to build those building blocks to have that conversation. And it must be challenged when someone is challenging something that is going to affect the way in which you want to raise your child. You should be thinking about what your friends are saying in front of your children. You should be thinking about what nursery you send your child to. You should be thinking about what gifts people buy for your kids. Do they reinforce the same racial rhetoric? Think about that. It's important. The second thing is education. Education is vital. There is not a job in the world that doesn't start without an educator. So if you do not get education right, you are going to dismantle the thinking of those children for the rest of their lives. They will grow up thinking they are lesser and another community will grow up thinking they are great. Because education is vital. And it's so vital that we need to make sure that it's not just a tick box. I don't believe in Black History Month. I don't like it. I don't think people are Black once a year. I think it's really important that this becomes so embedded that it's not an overt curriculum that I'm giving to you. Instead, it's drip fed in every single aspect of life. You're driving down the road, you see traffic lights. Tell your children, traffic lights system was developed by Garrett Morgan. That was a Black man. Let them know that. Your children are playing with a super soaker. Did you know Lonnie G. Johnson made that? Let them know that. When you're talking to your children about the CCTV that they have in their house, tell them about Marie Van Britten because they might not know that. It is important that you take everyday opportunities to drip feed this information to your children because what it does for black children is it reminds them that we can do things. We are valuable and we mean something. Mm. But you know what it does to white children? It says, you know what? They can do things. It's not what people tell us. They're not migrants and immigrants. They have helped to contribute to build not just the country we're in, but globally have contributed to the things that we use every day in our houses, light bulbs, radiator, even sanitary towels. Let the children know, because when they appreciate the value of everybody only then can we begin to believe that there is true equality and equity among ourselves and finally is about environment what environment are you raising your children within and you need to think about your house what's in your house 
What do you have there? What pictures and imagery do you use? I remember white Jesus. So the imagery I saw was Jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes. Even though the Bible doesn't depict Jesus in that way, Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes because that was the imagery that I saw. Imagery sticks with you. Think about what you show your children. What music do you listen to? What do they subliminally hear? What programs do you let them watch? For example, would you say to your child, I really want you to watch the CBBB's program, Jojo and Grand Grand, because that has a depiction of a, a black child and a grandmother, because I want that balance, as well as I'm going to let my child watch another program that might show another community and another culture. What are you feeding your child's development? with? Because that is vital to their understanding. Now, there are many, many, many resources you can use, and I'm quite happy to send a link out um, Simone and you can send that out through the event right after this event yeah but it's about taking time to invest in all the resources that you possibly can that's books that's music that's radio that's media but remember this if we truly want to strip racial superiority off its crown the only way we're going to do that is if we truly reflect look at our children nourish them and give them the information that makes them believe that they are all great they are all value, not just those that have white skin. Wow. There you go. Thank you, Aisha. So much in that, so much. Um, amazing. We've got some questions coming through. And so I really want to, okay, what's the time? Okay, five to eight. We're gonna try and do this 20 more minutes. So quarter past eight people, but I think this is really important. So I'm gonna, read these comments these questions and jade aisha stewart it's an open floor whichever one of you wants to to answer yeah so let's go back to first one i am part of a rural community that is not particularly diverse i'm not afraid of clumsy conversations and i admit they will be as i see them as an opportunity for me to be educated however educating others is hard for me when i lack that education around race myself I hear so many remarks I am uncomfortable with. Disagreeing with an opinion is one thing, but how do I do more? So I think the question is, so how do I do more to actively challenge racism, if I've read that right? I, oh, sorry, Jade. Oh, sorry. Go I, Jade and I then I touch upon that point. What did we do when we wanted to learn how to drive and when we wanted to, um, even in our studies outside of the tutorials what did we do we when something's important to us we will actively go out and find the resources have the conversations in order to become educated i don't want to downplay that comment because it is a very real feeling that that person's experiencing um, but I don't necessarily think it is always the job of the black community to educate white people, allies, and so on. Sometimes we're, we're just about trying to navigate our way through these systems ourselves. So I would encourage that individual with the same wherewithal and energy that they may have educated themselves in other matters and sourced out the material. There are a plethora of resources I'd be happy to share with them. We all would you, to assist you and empower you in becoming anti-racist and challenging those conversations. It can be done. You did it before with your education and learning things, I'm sure it can be done with this too. Awesome, thank you. Aisha, did you want to add something there? Um, all I was gonna say is, um, sorry, I don't know where my screen doesn't go big, so apologies guys if I look really small. But I think what's really important is about the practical steps. And I totally agree with everything that Jada said because that is important. But I think it's also about thinking, okay, well, how can I practically have that conversation, which is clearly what the person's asking. And I think sometimes it's difficult, but approach I do is say, help me understand. I love that line. Help me understand why you think this is not important. And sometimes you have to meet a person where they're at. You shouldn't have to, but the reality is you, you do. So when you say to someone, help me understand, it's about listening to that person and then going back to that person and breaking down why that thinking is so irrational 
and is so untrue. And I think that's something, particularly when it's a white person to white person, is a much easier conversation to have because sometimes it could become quite defensive or you're black, so you must think that way. But I think when you've got white on white having that conversation, it's help me understand why that's your thinking because this is the information that I have. And it's about trying to get them to understand where you've come to in your thinking so that you can both come to that understanding. Does that make sense? It's about not just immediately shutting down and saying, go to do the research. I think that's good, but some people ain't ready for the research. So sometimes I've got to meet you where you're at. And I think um, the, the person who posed the question, the first thing you can do is have that awareness and challenge that initial conversation. Brilliant. Two good points there. Education, but also meeting people where they are. Um, I think this is a comment. My niece five got told she had knotty hair. It was too messy. Early years is so important to start having dialogue and help them embody their race. And that's a comment and definitely a uh, question. As a youth organization committed to the equity and inclusion, we want to make spaces safe, inclusive and representative of a diversity of identities. Yet living on a predominantly white estate, we've struggled with this. What steps can we take to be more inclusive, particularly from those of a black, Asian or minor minority heritage? Anyone who want to take that? I'm happy to. I think what's really important is you need to really make them feel safe. That's the most important part is making them feel safe, making them feel heard and amplify their voices. But don't use them as tokenistic resources. Don't make them, as Jade said, do all the labor in order to obtain that information. Because actually you can have your race equality steering groups where you have that information. But actually this is where white allies really have to kick in because you need to protect, because it might be only one black person in your institution, it might be only one Asian person in your institution, you have to protect that person at all costs. But by doing that, you yourself begin to get that thinking and learning so it becomes a collaborative process. Because actually, I'm less worried about the spaces that I'm in. Because I know I can articulate myself and I know I can challenge, and I know by the time you need that conversation, you might not agree with me, but you're gonna understand my point. What about the spaces I'm not in? When it's all white spaces and it's all monocultural, we need to make sure that people have the right level of CPD so that they are equipped and they are empowered to have that conversation and they have enough information to challenge because we can't be in all those rooms. And with a system that is systemically racist, that already has most people at the top as white and actually white males, we need to make sure the right CPD is done and the right challenges at the top because actually we as black people can't carry the burden. There are white people who have to dismantle that on their behalf, not just on ours. Awesome. I'm going to go to the next. There's another comment. Come on. It's so important to be aware of what we are doing as parents, children here and see everything. So I think that was um, when Aisha was talking there um, before. So a question. Our own community, I think that's the black community, needs to have our story straight before educating other ethnicities. Uh, sadly, too many families have remnants of slave era values embedded in their minds concerning appearance, favoring lighter skin shades, straight hair. Uh, lots of black people in the black community think this way, sadly, and without even realizing they teach it to their children. How can this change? Well, I think Aisha kind of touched on that um, about what we, what we see. Am I right? But if there's anything else you want to add? I think the problem is what you have to understand. And it's the other thing about meeting people where they're at. I'm going to be honest, my journey to understand my blackness is fresh. It's new. I'll be honest and I'll say publicly to anybody, I didn't enjoy being black when I was a child. My mum sent me to a school and no, mum, I know you're in here somewhere, but I'm going to talk the real. My mum sent me to a school that was predominantly white. There were very few black people in that school and I had a real crisis with my identity. I had to live my whole life with a double consciousness. When I was at school, I was too black. When I was at home, I was too white. And so that is a really difficult um, conundrum to be in for a young person. So I'm only beginning to understand my blackness now, because remember the curriculum isn't doing this for us. And actually sometimes our own parents don't know any more information because they didn't have it either. So whilst I do believe as black people, it, we have to look at shadism, colorism, and the way in which we can sometimes internalize that self black hatred, at the same time, we have to understand people still don't have the tools. So this education is as much for us as black people to go and learn about who we are and where we come from, as much as it is about gaining allies, because we must do the work. 
do you know yourself? Do you know your history? And actually, we as black people also have to challenge the discrimination we see. So when you have someone saying, oh, I wouldn't date a black girl because black girls are all aggressive, rah, rah, rah. Are you challenging that? When someone's saying, oh, your hair's nappy, are you challenging that? When someone's saying, I only got a mixed race girls, are we challenging that? Because it's important that we challenge as much as we're asking other people to do the work. I think as well, I think as well if I can just um, add to Aisha's statement that indeed there's a lot of learning and unlearning that we as black people have had to do because of our upbringing, because of what we were taught. But I'd say as well, I wouldn't want anybody to bear the pressure of thinking they've got to go through generations and change everyone. Yeah. At, this, at this time, in that, my mother is always going to prefer it when my hair straightened. Because, you know, <laughs> she's in her mid-70s, I've tried, I've tried. She's always, it's ingrained that you're prettier with a straighter hair. So I turn up at my mum's house like this, it's like, you know, it's nice that you look so pretty with your hair straighter. And I've got to just be, I've just got to be comfortable maybe get over the fact that I am not going to change my entire family overnight. But then it goes back to your territory again, doesn't it? There are still some relationships that I have with my cousins, with my godchildren, with the younger people in, in my society that I can have a positive impact on. So I would say, you know, take the pressure off you trying to change generations. Start with that territory, however small that you have around you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a comment. I would recommend that any white person or anyone for that matter wanting to be more educated and to be inspired with ways to challenge racism should look at her work. There is a lot on YouTube. Ah, there must have been a comment before. Oh, Jane Elliott. Yeah, Jane she's Elliott. awesome. Absolutely yeah. awesome. Brilliant. Yeah, she is. I've, I've got, so I would encourage, thank you for that um, comment. Jane Elliott, fantastic speaker. Her resources regarding education, anti-racism, and she speaks and highlights ways that other cultures can also challenge racist behaviors and conversations. She's brilliant. So everyone in it, I would recommend everyone here, in here mm. to look her up. Um, any, any more questions coming through? There are a lot of comments. Uh, yes, amazing, a class divided. That's what I know, that's from Jane Elliott, from Jane Elliott. I'm just reading through the comments. Uh, I've got a comment here, just sent a poem I wrote, Aisha, my school life was very similar to yours. I was six when I first experienced racism and chose to write a poem to express some of my feelings and thoughts. Wow, it's, yeah, when you were talking there, Aisha, about the age, the ages and uh, of children, I think it's, imperative on all of us, black, white, whatever race we are, to really start um, speaking to our children because we've got to raise them in the way that we want them to go. And so I think it's imperative. When you were given those ages, it's almost scary to think um, how young their minds are being conditioned. And I've got to say, I, I love sitting and, and my daughter, um, she's nearly two now, she sat watching CBBS and Jojo and Grand Grand comes on. I love that um, the, the, about the black grandmother and the child because I mean, when I was growing up, there wasn't much. I didn't see many people that looked like me on TV, cartoons, etc. So it, it, it's re it's really yeah, it's amazing. I encourage that, but it's just about having. It's not. I think it's really important to say as well here. It's not black versus white. It's all of us against racism. And I know a lot of people have been saying that, and I really want to make it that clear. And that's where I stand and so many other people. It's not a, what we're seeing with George Floyd and, and the, the protests and everything that's happening. It is not a black versus white issue. It's really not. If you are against racism, then you're an ally of mine. <laughs> and I don't care what color you are, but we've just got to do better because we have been talking about this for so long this is years and years generations and generations of systemic racism and it's like time for change now and if we can all do our bit some of us are not going to get major stages we're not going to be on tv and a major but we can all do something where we are and i believe it starts there and it's really important for us all to do what we can do when we can do it and so it starts so tonight really i didn't want just a talking shop to be honest, because that does nothing, it profits nothing. And we've, we've been talking about a lot of things for a lot of years. This is really, how can we, what do we do? 
what are actionable outcomes. And so I hope that's what I hope that everyone gets from this, of things that we can do, each one of us can do where we are. Is no, it worth something? Sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. Um, I just I just noticed someone's question that popped up while you were talking. Oh, yeah. um, I guess there's two points. The point about what happens when the lights go out, they stop posting the squares, we're no longer kneeling, and the hashtag is no longer trending. Mm. I think the po most important thing to note about this, and you just touched on this, from a black perspective, this ain't new. Mm -hmm. That's right. We know. But there's an enlightenment for two different generations here. Yeah. And I think for many white people, this is real for the first time. Whilst they've known it, they've not had to absorb it, and there's never been a global understanding. Everybody focusing at it at the same time so there is something about keeping it relevant and not because it's a tick box and because someone's putting a hashtag or a company saying you know we we support black lives matter what it's about is actually you in your everyday life whatever your job role as jade said whatever your community is whatever school you go to making sure that this is lasting change in your bit of the world whatever that might look like that's really important but in addition to that it's about particularly around black people, is about protecting your peace. Please mm. understand, repeatedly seeing pictures and videos and images is not healthy. That's right. And so it is okay to say, I don't want to have this conversation right now. Mm. It is okay to say, I am overwhelmed. It's okay to say, don't share that picture with me. Because if you don't protect your peace, your well is going to run dry. It's a little bit about like that image where you've got someone on the airplane, you've got to put your mask on before your child. And actually, you have to protect your inner peace before you're protecting anybody else's. But when you are ready to do the work, let's go. Yeah, that's key. And, and I think that is, it's about protecting ourselves, our mental health. I'll be honest, I haven't watched the video of George Floyd being murdered. I haven't watched it. Still images was enough. Because when me as a black person, when I watch that or see that image, that's my father, my husband, my brother. It's different. And so I can't, and certain videos I don't click on. I'll just read a caption and I know where this is going. And so we relive that every single time. And so I, I yeah, that's key. Aisha, thank you for that. We have to I've be- I've also learned to, sorry, I've also, on that protecting your peace point, learn to be very honest. You know, I don't know if this is a British thing, but how are you today, Jade? Straight away, yeah, I'm fine, I'm good. Over the last few weeks, especially with my colleagues, when they have asked me how I am, I haven't given them chapter and verse, I'm quite a private person, but I've said it has been a hard few weeks for me, for my community, because some people just need an open door. Mm -hmm. And I've had two very good dialogues with colleagues from being very honest. I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. Because we don't realize, we think it's preservation. So over the years, we have hidden these feelings, these, the microaggressions, the, the, the things we learned growing up about our blackness. And we've hidden them and we thought that's good. We're preserving them. We are assimilating with our white counterparts. It's the right thing to do. And then we wonder why mental health amongst the black community is, is so high. So I am learning to that person who asked the question about protecting your peace, to be very honest. Can I call you tonight, Jade? No, I'm resting. Mm -hmm. Or I'm taking a social media break. And to black people, there is nothing to feel bad about, about not reposting that image, about mm -hmm. not reposting that hashtag. You do not need to prove to anyone, irrespective of what color they are, that you are black, a like true black by posting and reposting things. Because you cannot fight a battle when you're completely laid out and wounded. That's why I said from the outset, before we start making any agendas, take care of this first, this first, and then we can put in the work. The second point I wanted to address, just to pick up from Aisha is, and it's a question as well, this has been on a, an agenda for decades. <laughs> Go on to YouTube, you'll see my father, before I was born, early 80s, talking about the race riots in Bristol. Same thing, 
police brutality, young black men developing mental health illnesses because they've been stopped and searched once, twice, three, four, five times a week. It's been on the, and, and there, there were inquiries, there were conversations. It's been on the agenda for decades. So whilst I'm all about the learning and the education piece, I don't want in another 50 years, my son or daughter sat here having the same conversation about race. There has to be an accountability. Now, every company that showed the black square, every company that has an equal opportunities policy, we, collective we, black, white, whatever, making them accountable to the promises that they have made when it comes to equity, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Because we can't be having the same discussion in 50 years. We simply cannot. No, that's it. And that's key. And I think you said something there, um, Jade, about not feeling that you have to repost, you have to do. And I saw something, I think it was a meme, or somebody had written something. Some of us are protesting. Some of us are posting. Some of us, just do what you can do. Some of us are educating ourselves. I think as long as we're doing something to help, like you said, it might just be holding companies accountable. That might be your thing. But mental health, your peace comes first. So thank you for... You posted that I'm mindful of the time. I think we'll just one more. I think some of these are comments. Uh, and I think we've probably touched on some of them as, as we've been talking. Um, I add something in. Obviously, yeah, um, you guys talked about obviously going around this in terms of history and around. Um, I'm just noticed that obviously, do you feel, and I'm just asking a question to the panel, like that this time around, that things are a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I think we've got to understand that white people have responsibility to educate now, and actually, we do need to understand that we do need to have these these conversations. And, and I'm, you know, I'm seeing lots of posts, um, people reading more books, um, you know, really listening to podcasts, you know, trying to educate and trying to understand more. Do you feel that that is uh, a change that you have you seen that before from white people, or how, is that the case at this time round? There is, is is a shift. That, that you know white people are trying to understand and actually realize there is a responsibility that we have because you've had that voice trying to trying to fight with that with that voice for years and now are white people allies you know coming alongside and actually understanding and trying to educate and trying to do something and realizing that it's an equal responsibility to bring about some change i have mixed feelings on that i'd say when you see the entire 50 states of america protesting about Black Lives Matter in the middle of a global pandemic, plus 20 plus countries filled with people of all races, then I'm inclined to conclude that there has been some kind of shift. But then when I go to my LinkedIn account, and then when I go to the office, so to speak, and there's an eerie silence, like tumbleweed, then I'm inclined to think, not and that's why i'm sorry if i sound a bit resolute with my responses i, I want to be sympathetic to my white allies and white people who are about going in and doing the work in the education but part of me i just keep thinking 50 years ago it was my father 50 years later it's it's my brother my husband and it's it's the same thing so I really don't know. I'm really on the fence. I, there, there's something that gives me a lot of hope when I see that solidarity at the, at the protests. But then on the professional landscape, it's been eerily quiet, eerily silent for me. You make a great point, Jade. I think the thing is, I think in theory, it sounds great. In theory, I'm hopeful, I'm passionate, I'm ready, I'm active, all of the things and above. Twice this week, People are, no, three times this week actually, people have written letters to their employers and they've shared the letters with me. They've shared the responses. I'm not convinced. Mm -hmm. Some of it feels like a PR stunt. Some of it feels political because it's right to do. I want to see systemic change. I want to see structural change. I want legacy. I will know there's a shift when my son's grandson isn't in this conversation. <laughs> and I'll be dead and gone then, but that's when we will know there's a shift. Because this isn't, it's not going to happen in, in a year, in a day. We're in a pandemic. People are at home. People are, some of them ain't got nothing to do. What I need to see is when, when the life goes back to normal, 
and we're all working again and we're, where we've got some kind of normality to life, are we still having these conversations? Are things still shaking up? Is this got longevity? Because then, only then, do I believe there'll be lasting change. Until then, it's just another notch. Completely agree, to be honest. I see some positivity, like the solidarity, and then you might scroll a bit more and then you see some comments that are being made. I, I still struggle why there's such an outrage when we start challenging racism. I, 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 it, it baffles me. I mean, some people are outraged when you start saying, well, this is wrong, systemic racism. Oh, well, you know, the, the statue coming down in Bristol, and I, you know, I won't stay too long with this, but, um, you know, my opinion is there are so many people concerned about a statue and not about what that statue represented. And that is a problem to me. We grew, I grew up in Bristol, I'm from Bristol. Some of the other ladies on the panel, actually, that wasn't planned. Um, but <laughs> grew up having to see that statue, see those road names, see the name of that school, you know, and we were supposed to be okay with it. And the minute it's challenged, they're challenging us. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I, I'm confused by that. So. We will see when, when the pandemic's over, when we're allowed out of lockdown, when we go back to life. Yeah, we've got to keep this going. What I will say is not going to happen overnight. It's not a sprint, but we've got to keep these conversations going. So thank you so much. I think that is it. I'm mindful of the time. I really hope that you know, everyone listening, you got a lot out of this. And I would just encourage you have keep this conversation going where you are, do what you can where you are. That's the only way we're gonna make change. And, you know, protect your peace, protect your mental health and, and keep going, keep going. It's not gonna happen overnight, but we're hopeful, hopeful that changes will, will take place. Um, please connect in with the speakers, so Jade Linton, Aisha Thomas, Stuart Dix, connect with them, LinkedIn, Instagram, I believe you're on the socials. I'll send around um, some, some of the resources um that were spoken about in any more i'll send those around event bright apologies that we have technical issues with the the youtube i tested it yesterday and look what happens they say it'll be all right on the night and yeah so um, but thank you all so much for coming and connecting and, and connect with me as well i just said to connect with me as well i'd love to carry on and look out for this we're going to be having more simone space i'm going to be doing this trying to do this as, as often as possible other topics so i will keep you up Dated. Take care of yourself, people. See you later. <laughs>